Good evening. It's March 21st, and this is the March edition of Continental Commandery Naval Order of the United States Maritime History Virtual Lecture Series. Um, we're just about coming up on our third anniversary, having started during the COVID shutdown. Uh, Captain Aaron Bresnahan came up with the great idea of having virtual lectures for members of the Continental Commandery. And subsequently, we expanded it to invite all Naval Order companions and their friends. Um, since then, we've recorded more than 30 presentations. And you can find out about those past presentations by going to the Commandery website and selecting past events. At the top of that page, you'll see our YouTube page. Our older presentations are in one location. Our presentations from 2023 and forward are in the live presentations page. Uh, before introducing this evening's speaker, uh, let me say a few words about the Naval of the United States for those of you who might be guests and not yet companions. Um, we are the oldest ancestral organization in the United States dedicated to maritime history, with our mission being to preserve, promote, and celebrate U.S. maritime history and camaraderie amongst our companions. Uh, anyone who has served in any of our maritime services, uh, which you saw illustrated during the uh, uh, Secretary Mildorf uh, Naval Order March at the introduction, um, are welcome to join. You can get more information by visiting the Naval Order website and asking about membership under how to join NOUS. Today's presentation is being recorded on YouTube. Um, those of you watching are watching via live stream and the YouTube recording will be available immediately after conclusion of the program. Uh, you use the same link to get to the YouTube recording as you did to watch this evening. During the program, if you'd like to post a question, uh, simply post it to the comments box. And once uh, Commander Wallace has completed his formal presentation, we will engage in a question and answer period during which I will share your questions with him. Commander George Wallace, uh, United States Navy retired, served in the Navy for 22 years as an officer on nuclear submarines. He served on the USS John Adams, SSBN 620, USS Woodrow Wilson, SSBN 624, as executive uh, officer above, aboard the uh, Sturgeon class nuclear attack submarine, USS Spadefish, SSN 668, and commanded the USS Houston, SSN uh, 713. Parenthetically, I will note, uh, I had the pleasure of uh, hosting their first port visit to Houston back in, if memory serves, it was 1981. Um, he was the skipper of the Houston from 1990 to 1992, and then completed his active duty career as a citizen, excuse me, just washed my teeth, can't do a thing with him. Um, Assistant Chief of Staff, Subgroup 5. Uh, George and uh, Don Keith have teamed up to write a best-selling novel, Final Bearing, and then Firing Point. Firing Point was adapted to become a uh, major motion picture, Hunter Killer. Uh, other submarine thriller model, um, novels on which they've collaborated include Dangerous Grounds, Cuban Deep, Fast Attack, Arabian Storm, War Shot, Silent Running, and Snapshot. Um, their latest story, Southern Cross, will be released in May. Uh, independently, uh, he's the author of Operation Golden Dawn. Without further ado, uh, I want to welcome George aboard. Uh, George, glad yeah. to have you this evening. Look forward to hearing your formal presentation. Um, when did you first fall in love with the idea of becoming a, a submariner? A submariner. You need to oh, learn. Excuse me. Excuse me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Submariner is a subpar mariner, which we are not. <laughs> I, I, I didn't say bubblehead. 
<laughs> that I'll accept. Okay. <laughs> no, I I uh, probably fell in love with submarining and you know being a nuke uh, in college. Um, and interestingly, and Rick was probably rolling over when I say this, I was a uh, agricultural engineer, one course short of having a combined degree in, in civil civil engineering. Mm -hmm. And I uh, volunteered to be a CB. Wow. And I turned down for that uh, because I didn't have a civil degree. So uh, nuclear power and submarine was my second choice, which the kindly old gentleman did not view very kindly. <laughs> they let you in anyway. They let me in anyway. So we know how low his standards were. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, you've got a fascinating program this evening. I don't want to take up any more of your time, so I will give you the deck and the con and uh, move off screen and let you take over. Very well, I relieve you, sir. All right. Tonight, we're going to look at a short history of submarine technology, and we're going to start with the turtle and run it through. You know, I titled it through the Virginia class, but I actually we're going to spend some time with the Columbia class as well. Now, Interestingly, submarining and submarines, as far as the U.S. is concerned, predates the Navy. The first submarine, the Turtle, was part of the Army. Uh, in 1775, uh, David Bushnell started building the Turtle, along with some help from uh, several of his friends, and went from there in uh, let's go to the next slide. Do I advancing the slides or are you advancing the slides? Okay. All you right. You have full control. I have full control, so I advance the slides. Anyway, as I was saying, we're going to look at the Turtle. We're going to look at the Hunley, several others, uh, some U.S. boats, as the technology advances over the years. Um, some of the technology and some of the uh, submarine uh, changes were meant to exploit opponents, their real and apparent weaknesses. You know, we submariners are sneaky and stealthy by nature, and the uh, technology was meant to enhance that. <clears throat> and in some cases, to overcome uh, weaknesses in our part uh, is part of the technology. And we're going to start to cover each one of these areas in, in some detail. And we're going to find that many times the uh, the design and the technology was meant to uh, enhance one area that was not used, but greatly enhanced another area which was vital. And there are several places where various aspects of the technology come together in a, in a synergy that is really um, somewhat unique. And as I was saying, the Turtle was our first submarine. It was actually, as I said, part of the Army. Bushnell designed it. Many people think it was a barrel, but it was not. It was actually more, looks more like a clam. It's, if you look at this, it's 10 feet long. It's about six foot tall and about three foot thick, or a beam of about three foot. And it was powered, if you look here on the propeller here, that is powered by a foot pedal. And this up here at the top, this screw was meant to bore into the hull of the target ship. And then they would at it would attach this barrel, which is the mine, and then the uh, turtle would float away, the mine would detonate, and the ship sinks. That was the theory. A um, couple of problems with this, it had about 30 to 40 minutes worth of air in, internal to it uh, before he had to surface and bring air in through these um, snorkels, if, if you would, uh, to get some fresh air into the boat so he could breathe some more. Uh, pretty uh, manpower intensive. It was a lot of hard work to move this thing. Uh, 
he could get about three knots out of it on a good day, and it's clearly meant only for a harbor. Um, the first attack was against the uh, Eagle, HMS Eagle, which was Lord Howe's flagship in New York Harbor. Uh, he would, uh, uh, just the uh, pilot was unable to uh, attach, unable to bore a hole to attach the uh, mine. Common, you know, common knowledge is that he couldn't uh, bore through the copper plating that was used to uh, uh, attack the tornado worms that were the, the dearth of uh, wooden ships at the time. But that copper plating was paper thin. He could have gone through that easily. He most likely hit uh, some of the iron uh, that uh, was for the rudder mounting, the, the pencils for the rudder, rudder mounting, uh, and then floated away so that he did, was unsuccessful in uh, attaching that. Overall, the, the turtle was not a success. Uh, they made the one attack, tried to make a second, but was unable to do that. From a technology viewpoint, it was interesting. Uh, some things like it had a buoyancy system, there was a, it flooded water into the bottom to sink into the bottom of the barrel, if you will, and to float, he could pump that out with a, with a uh, hand pump. Also had uh, lead that he could drop off to, to surface immediately. Uh, but as, but overall, not very successful, not very maneuverable and extremely short range. If we move on from the Revolutionary War, there were several um, sub subsequent models or um, attempts at submarine design over the years uh, from 1785 to uh, the Civil War. Uh, Robert Fulton uh, had a design, tried to sell it to the U.S. The U.S. was not interested. He tried to sell it to Napoleon. Napoleon was also not inter interested, so he came back and built something called the Claremont and made his fame there. Uh, there was a French design later in the 1830s, also not successful. We come to the next successful design was the Alligator. Now, this was a Union ship built by um, Nefi and Levy in Philadelphia, a design from Brutus de Villiers, who was a Frenchman, and was launched in 1862. Uh, they lost it in 1863. The first design of it had 18 men along the sides here with oars. And if you can imagine a submerged ship, now it was only submerged to 10 feet or so, but a submerged ship with 18 penetrations, well, yeah, 18 penetrations with oars, uh, the watertight integer to be an extreme problem. Uh, they first deployment of the ship was in that powered in that manner. Then uh, the Navy said, no, nope, let's do a, use it with a screw. And they actually mounted a screw on it. And then these, the same 18 men were a hand cranking a crank that ran the entire length of the ship. Now this ship uh, actually had a lock-in lock-out chamber so that a diver could be deployed while submerged. And the weapon was his idea, his duty was to swim over underneath the target ship, attach a mine, swim back and get back on board the submarine and then the submarine would float away and they would detonate the mine. Uh, the alligator never made a, an attack on anybody and they were towing it from um, Philadelphia down to Charleston and lost it in a storm someplace off Cape Hatteras. And it's kind of interesting. It was about a very similar location to where they lost the uh, monitor when it sank. Uh, they found the alligator just a couple of years ago. They haven't made no attempt to recover it, but it was an interesting technology. We moved from the monitor, from the, uh, Alligator to the Hunley. Now the Hunley 
it's a common misconception with the Hunley is it was somebody took a, a uh, boiler and adapted it as a submarine. And that's not true. It was entirely designed from the plate up as a submarine. Um, had a crew of eight, hand cranked, uh, top speed of about three knots. Uh, I will say, uh, parenthetically, this is the first multi-crew submarine. And it was multi-crew because it went through three crews. Uh, it sank twice in sea trials, with once with the loss of all hands, and once with the loss of all hands except the uh, lieutenant in charge, who managed to escape. And then, of course, when it made its attack, uh, all hands were lost. It had um, some interesting technologies. Had a ballast tank at either end for submerging, and then pumps to pump the dry when they wanted to surface. Uh, as I said, a crew of eight, seven lows, hand cranked the uh, propeller, and the officer in charge actually stood or kneeled and looked out through a port portholes in this for lack of a better term, conning tower there, uh, so that he could steer. The uh, propeller was actually a shrouded propeller, which we'll see later when we get around to the looking at Virginia's, the Virginia class. So and I guess in some ways, uh, this ship is uh, 150 years ahead of its time, in that, at least in that one particular uh, area. It did have lead ballast under, you know, underneath the keel. It was bolted on, and the bolts came all the way through into the uh, the people tank. And they were designed so that in an emergency, the crew could unbolt the ballast. It would drop off, and then, in theory, the uh, Hunley would bob to the surface. In uh, 1864... It deployed to attack the uh, USS Housatonic, which which was about five miles off of Charleston Harbor. And the weapon it had was a spar torpedo. Now you think torpedoes, and we commonly think of these high-speed weapons that go flitting off and uh, hit some ship at a distance. Uh, not the case here. This was a on the end of a about a 16 foot pole. It was 135 pounds of black powder in a uh, copper canister, a copper can. And various theories on what the detonation was meant to be, or meant to, the, the mechanism. It looks from the things that they've pulled up in the recovery of the Husata, over the uh, Hunley that there was probable, probably an electronic or electrical detonation uh, where when they attached the spar, then uh, they would detonate the charge by hitting the battery. Now, what, another concept that, that's been taught in history quite a bit, which doesn't look to be true now, is that it was designed to ram that spar into the hull of the target ship and then back away a safe distance for the charge to discharge. Uh, and it doesn't look like that was the concept at all as far as this attack was concerned. The, the uh, charge actually looks like it detonated when they speared it so that the, the Hunley was nominally 16 foot away and 135 pounds of black powder and a detonation underwater causes quite a pressure pulse. And from what they found from the uh, recovery of the vessel is everybody on board looked to be killed instantaneously. There was no attempt at pumping, no attempt at uh, dropping the ballast off, uh, nothing. In fact, uh, there was looked like there was no attempt at even trying to, to do anything. They were, all of the bodies were found still at their normal seats. So the theory on this one is 
it blew up on an initial detonation and sank right there. Uh, but this was the very first successful attack by a submarine. Now we'll go from there to our next boat, which is the Holland. The USS Holland, SS-1, was actually John Holland's seventh attempt at a submarine. Uh, John Holland was a, an Irishman. He was quite an Irish patriot. And his first six attempts, he tried to sell to the Irish uh, for use against the British. Uh, the Irish didn't buy it, didn't buy any of them. Uh, so he came to, he was in the U.S. So he came to the Navy and sold his seventh attempt to the Navy as the, uh, the, uh, the Holland at the U.S. or SS-1. Uh, it's an interesting uh, side note, he then sold several of them to the British. So I guess he, is, he was more interested in profit than he was in his Irish revolutionary thoughts. Anyway, the Holland was built in at the Crescent Shipyard in Elizabeth, New Jersey. It was commissioned on 12 October 1900. So that is the date the submarines, submarine service, uh, dates the beginning. So I guess we are now in our 124th year. The Holland itself had some interesting technologies. It was gasoline powered, had a four uh, cylinder auto engine, gasoline, gasoline fueled, and a 66 cell uh, lead acid battery. Crew of six, now this was meant as a coastal defense weapon. It had a uh, 75 foot max depth, could make five knots surfaced and 5.5 knots submerged. So it was actually faster submerged than it was surfaced. And had a 200 mile um, surfaced range and about a 30 mile submerged range. Now, uh, Teddy Roosevelt actually deployed on the plunger SS2, which was a, a sister ship of the Holland when he was president in 1905 and he was went out in Long Island Sound uh spent an afternoon they took him to the maximum of the deep deep depth of 75 foot and uh when he got back on shore he decided submarine was so dangerous that he instituted submarine pay the next year. Now the Holland itself, for weapons, it had uh, three torpedo tubes, you know, uh, and a dynamite gun. Now, a dynamite gun is uh, not a weapon you normally run across, but it was a uh, cannon, more or less, that was underneath this shroud right here and, and went back at an angle. The idea was the uh, Holland would stick its nose up out of the water and then blast this dynamite gun and shoot a shell into a target ships somewhere around. The, the cannon itself was about a six inch gun. Uh, the Holland, as far as I know, is the only uh, submarine that ever had one. The, we go from the Holland, we'll go to World War II. The U.S. through the period from 1900 through the 1930s did an evolution of submarining and submarine designs with oh, the, the O-boats, the S-boats, the R-boats. Cube, the O-boat, oh, I said the O-boats, but a whole series of different submarine designs. They never really settled down on one uh, until they got to the fleet boats in the late 30s. Uh, and if you look at the, those boats, you'll find there's a whole series of evolutionary changes. Um, when we get to the fleet boats in the 1938-39 timeframe, now, there were, we're talking of the Gato, Gato class. 
Now, the reason I have spade fish up here, if you were paying attention to my introduction, is I was XO of the SSN668 spade fish. The SS411 spade fish was, I guess, uh, the our, our namesake from World War II. The fleet class themselves brought together, they were brought together some interesting design functions. They were designed and meant to be advanced scouts for the battle fleet. Now, if you remember your uh, strategy and history from World War II, the uh, War Plan Orange, the battle fleet was meant to deploy from the West Coast or Pearl Harbor, go charging across the Pacific, meet the Japanese in some Titanic battle somewhere halfway across, and then that decides the war, which we know it didn't exactly happen that way. But the fleet boats were designed to be the advanced scouts for that battle fleet as they charged across the Pacific. Now that tasking meant that they needed long legs. They needed to be able to run for long distances out in front of the fleet without support. So they were fueled for about 11,000 miles. They also were meant to be fast, relatively you know, fa fast for their time, so they could do about 21 knots on the surface. They could do about eight or nine knots submerged. Uh, they did have big batteries. They had two 126-cell lead-acid batteries, which give them... If they're doing that eight or nine knots, because it's about three hours submerged. If they are keeping their power down to three or four knots, then they've got about eight to 12 hours submerged endurance before they have to surface and recharge their batteries. Uh, they carried four diesels. Uh, there were various makes. Most of them were Fairbanks Morris diesels. Uh, the Fairbanks Morris are very reliable machines. And... They carried uh, 10 torpedo tubes, six forward, four aft, and 24 torpedoes. Uh, you've all heard stories about how reliable the Mark 14 torpedo was at the beginning of World War II, uh, which they weren't. And that was a lesson that was very hard, learned very hard, very hardly. Um, with a lot of pushback from both the command structure and from the from uh, Naval Torpedo Station Newport, which is now uh, Newark Naval Underwater Weapons Systems Command in Newport, who had designed and built the torpedo. Uh, no, uh, that had a number of overlying problems that it, it was like an onion. You peeled back one and there was a problem. Underneath that, you peeled that back, there's another problem. So it took them a while to get around to getting all the problems out and making them work 14 a reliable weapon, which caused a loss of a bunch of submarines and it cost a, you know, a lot of chance in World War II. The boat itself uh, had a uh, depth limit of about 300 feet. And for the Gato, they were called the thin skinned, if you will. And then they were relieved by, or replaced by the Baleo class later in the war. Spadefish was actually a Baleo class. Uh, they were called thick-skinned. Uh, they had a depth of limit of 400 feet. Now, interesting about the World War II designs, now, this obviously far be predates computers, and a lot of the structural engineering goes into modern submarines. So the safety margins were huge. <clears throat> there are documented uh, stories of the Gato class being down to 800 feet or more, uh, the Baleo class, some of them being down to 1,000 feet or more, obviously far in excess of test depth. Not something you typically want to test, but in a combat situation, you, you get forced into that. Uh, but these ships were, as I said, uh, designed as surface ships that, that dove occasionally. They weren't designed to run underwater all the time or even most of the time. 
the <clears throat> some of the technologies that came together in World War II, along with the technology of the submarine itself, uh, improvements in sonar, and really radar. Uh, radar, both the SJ and the SD types of radar, the surface search and the air search, were a real boon to the submarine warfare of World War II uh, from the U.S. standpoint in that it made uh, night surface attacks possible. And those from 43 to late four, to 45 were probably most of the attacks, the most successful attacks on merchant ships were night surface attacks. The uh, boats would make the detection, uh, do what was called an end around, use their speed to go over the horizon, just at the radar horizon, circle around in front of the ships, the target ships, and then make their attack that way. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, with their low profile and their speed, uh, they could get in amongst the uh, convoys and successfully get multiple targets uh, in many occasions. Now let's go on a little bit to, we're going to cover one of the real um, nexus of technologies. And we're going to cover these next three, I'm going to cover them separately, but think of them overlying themselves. The uh, Albacore Hall. Now, if you remember back, I said that the Baleo Gato class and the Wo World War II submarines were designed primarily as surface ships that dove occasionally. By the end of World War II, the Germans had come around with technology changes to change that. Their concept became, because of the success the Allies were having in the uh, Battle of the Atlantic, to make their submarines pri primarily submarines, spend most of their time submerged, only surface when they had to, which from their viewpoint was hopefully when they were going out and coming home. That meant that a couple things had to happen. The boat had to be designed as more hydrodynamic rather than surface ship type. Uh, so they came up with the Type 21 design. I don't have a good picture for Type 21. Uh, it's not the Albacore Hall that you see here, but more like uh, if you look at the picture of the Nautilus, which we're going to show up in a minute, that's much closer to it. It also had to have uh, larger batteries for submerged time, but more importantly, had to have a way of charging those batteries while keeping the ship submerged. That meant a snorkel. Uh, snorkel is really nothing more than a pipe that sticks up out of the water to suck air in so that the diesels can run to charge the batteries. Um, and hopefully with a valve on it to keep the water from coming in if, the, if, you, if you get water down the pipe. Um, but that was a real revolution in submarine technology was that ability. All of our boats in World War II had to surface and run on the surface to recharge the batteries. There was no chance, no technology to run with a snorkel. The, um, <clears throat> after World War II, we did run several tests and several concepts with um, redesigning or rebuilding, uh, modifying some of the World War II submarines. Uh, they were called Guppy, uh, Greater Underwater uh, Propulsion, and there was a Guppy 1 and a Guppy 2 design, which included the snorkel, uh, included uh, some hydrodynamic changes, the, uh, both in the free flood area on the deck and also um, in the sail itself. But in 54, we built the albacore. The albacore is, if you look at it, I mean, it, it looks, I mean, just looking at it, it looks fast underwater, and it was meant to be. Diesel powered, entirely an experimental submarine. Uh, this boat didn't even have a torpedo tube. 
uh, was never meant to. It was meant only to experiment with uh, underwater technologies, either for both speed and for, for uh, flow noise, for sound silencing. And the sound silencing was probably every bit as important as the speed. Uh, although this boat did have the underwater speed record for a whole lot of years at something greater than 35 knots, um, which is really hauling for a diesel boat. They also uh, experimented with things like uh, an X stern. So instead of having a rudder and a stern planes, it had an X. And we'll see that technology when we get around to Columbia at the end. Um, but you take that and this next technology, and I think we made some comments early on about the irascible gentleman, uh, Admiral Rickover. This is his baby, the Nautilus. And he responds, you know, the father of nuclear submarining. Nuclear power was a real revolution in submarining. This broke the um, tie from the for the submarine from the surface. The submarine became a true submarine, no longer a surface ship that dove occasionally. Uh, the Nautilus and her children can leave port, dive, run for until their food runs out, and then surface and come on. You know, the, literally the food is the only limitation on submerged operations uh, for these submarines. Even the Nautilus with the uh, S2W core that she had back in 1954 uh, could run thousands of miles. Uh, she had to refuel about every 18 months or so. The boats we're talking about when we get to the end of the presentation are life of haul. They never need to refuel. But uh, this, notice this is not an albacore hull. This looks like a, uh, actually looks a lot like a Type uh, 21 uh, German boat, but it also looks like a guppy. It's a surface, I mean, it's a um, diesel boat hull, if you will, with a nuclear reactor and steam plant. And Rick Over did this on purpose. His idea was he would test one technology at a time. He took a tried and true hull technology and tied in a revolutionary power plant. Uh, it was a pressurized water reactor and you know, we'll spend a couple of seconds with reactor theory. Basically what happens is the fission reaction gives off energy. The energy uh, is passed on to water that's, just, that's passed through the, the core to cool it. That water goes to a steam generator where it heats secondary water through a heat exchanger, through a steam generator. And then that secondary water goes and uh, turns the turbines, which either makes electricity uh, for, the, for the turbine generators or makes the screw go around for the main turbines. And then that secondary water goes back to the steam generators again and the cycle continues. Um, And the, when the Nautilus hit the fleet, uh, it, was a, it really was a revolution. Uh, her maximum speed was about somewhere around 25 knots, but she could do that forever. She could cross the Atlantic that way and did. Uh, she was the first boat to go under the ice, up over, under the North Pole and around. So you had a lot of um, endurance. The, nobody had anything close to that technology, so it became quite revolutionary. The Russians came out with their uh, Type 1, their, what we call the HEN class, the Hotel Echo and November classes a couple of years later um, to catch up. Now, you take that technology, you tie it to the Abelcor hull, and you go to the next technology, the missile boat, the Polaris submarine, and the Polaris missile. And now you've got a real nexus, a real synergy of technologies. You've got a 
uh, submarine with revolutionary capabilities with worldwide reach as a strategic weapon system. Uh, and it all came, this all came together in just a couple of, a few years. Uh, in fact, the Polaris system came together in four years. It was four years from the time the Navy gave the go ahead to general uh, the electric boat to change the design for the, what was the uh, uh, Scorpion uh, to the George Washington. Now, the common misconception is this, the uh, original Scorpion was cut in half, pulled apart, and they dropped the missile compartment in, in the middle. That really didn't happen. Uh, although they started work on the, the Scorpion, which became the George Washington, um, they hadn't gotten far enough where they needed to cut in half to do that. But from the time the Navy gave the go-ahead to build the George Washington until the George Washington left on its first deterrent patrol was four years. Don't think we're going quite that good with the Columbia. Um, and then we went from the George Washington to the 41 for freedom which were, was the original Washington class, Lafayette class, Madison class, and Franklin class. All, and they're all pretty much the same. You really have to know what you're looking at to be able to tell them apart if you see them all, if you saw them all together. Uh, they're all 16 missiles, uh, originally Polaris, and then uh, modified the Lafayette class beyond were modified to Poseidon. Uh, the, the Washington's couldn't be modified to Poseidon. They stayed with Polaris A3. <clears throat> then um, later modified the Madison and beyond, uh, class and beyond. I got another, yeah, the Madison class and beyond were modified with the uh, Trident C4 in the uh, uh, early 80s. But you take that technology uh, those three technologies put them together and a, a true nexus in, uh, in history. The uh, strategic weapons, Polaris and follow on were all solid fuel, which is somewhat different than the Russians who stayed with liquid fuel for a long time with a lot of problems. Uh, a compact warhead, which made using a small missile like the Polaris possible. <clears throat> very precise navigation. The To use a strategic weapon, a ballistic missile, to try to hit a target, the submarine has to know where it is before it sends the missile off to hit the target. And precise navigation from the Polaris viewpoint was a, a order of magnitude different than what precise navigation was known at, at the time, either for submarines or for surface ships. Uh, rather than knowing where you are within a mile or so, which is if you're out in the open water, that's fine. Uh, you had to know where you are within a few feet. And that was true whether you were on the surface or at, at periscope depth while getting a fixed source of some kind, or you were submerged, operating submerged, you had no outside uh, fixed source. What that led to was the um, Um, the SINs. SINs are ship's inertial navigation system uh, and subsequent technologies with the ESGN and the ring laser gyros, which basically use uh, gyroscopic motion uh, to stabilize a platform and then accelerometers to measure the forces in all three axes for how the, the ship is moving uh, very precisely. So you can enter a fix, enter it into SINs, and then SINs will measure from that point for some period of time before the errors add up and then you have to have another fix. And the other technology that was important was submerged launch. We originally, back 
prior to the uh, George Washington tried to use cruise missiles with the uh, Regulus on first a couple of um, diesel boats, the Grayback, and then uh, a nuke boat, the Halibut. But these were limited range, less than a thousand miles. Uh, they were subsonic, or yeah, subsonic. They were low flying and they required mid course guidance. So the ship had to surface, had to take the, the missile out of its hangar, get it up on the launch rails, fuel it, and then launch it before they dove again. And then some other boat would have to be somewhere close to the target country on the surface, guiding this missile in, which is not very effective. So the George Washington and the Poseidon boats allowed submerged launch from with the Poseidon, with the Polaris uh, in the neighborhood of a thousand to fifteen hundred miles. Once we get to the uh, Tridents, now we're talking much longer ranges in the in the six thousand mile category. But by staying submerged, I mean the, all you're going to see is the missiles coming out of the water. And the way they did this, it's interesting, the original was with air, but then they used uh, gas generators, which are not a whole lot more than rocket motors, that point, they're in the bottom of the launch tube and then point up in the launch tube so that the uh, exhaust goes around the missile, lifts the missile up, but then keeps it in a um, air envelope so the missile never gets wet. And it goes up, ignites, and takes off, and then we're, we're off to the races. Now let's go from that to my spade fish. One of the nice things about putting these slide these presentations together yourself is you can pick the ship you want. And so I picked my spade fish. And we'll see my Houston in a minute. Now these are fast attack boats. The uh, 637s and the boats before that, but we're going to stick with the 637s. They were the largest class of, of this particular group. Uh, they were originally designed to go out and do anti submarine warfare, uh, go find the Russian submarines and trail them, play with them. Where they ended up spending a whole lot of their time, though, was doing what we call the ISR or INW mission. And basically what that is, is setting off somebody's coast and watching, listening for days, weeks, months at a time. Uh, sounds like it's extremely boring and God it is. And it's also extremely important. Uh, this class of boat had the, uh, room that is designed build room to include some very sophisticated uh technology for uh electronic warfare for sucking up those signals we're talking about and was uh, very nicely designed for operation of periscope depth so you could do this for long periods of time in uh reasonably high sea states and if you stop to think about where a lot of this operation was happening, uh, sea states can get very high. The, if you look here, this tube right here, that's where a tote array goes on. And we're, we're gonna spend a little time on tote array in a minute, but that's one of the uh, advanced sensors that this particular platform happened to have. Um, the Sturgeon class is about 3,600 tons, so not that big of a submarine, 4,600 tons submerged, and about 292 foot um, long and about a 32 foot beam, and about a 25 foot draft. Not a whole lot bigger than those uh, Baleo and Gato class we were talking about earlier. Ooh, I gotta talk faster, I've got five minutes left. Okay, 
We'll go from there to Houston. This is a seven, the 713 was a 688 class. This is the largest class submarine we ever built. This class was meant to go with the fleet and was designed for deep water ASW and, and speed. Um, and we're not going to spend a whole lot of time here because I'm running out of time, I guess. The Ohio class, we've talked a little bit about. She was or is our current uh, FBM submarine fleet, li fleet ballistic missile submarine form or uh, change the design to SSGNs. So they have uh, dry deck shelters here for SEAL operations and will also house uh, 154 Tomahawk missiles. The Florida actually launched 104 of them against Libya a few years ago in you know, one day. Virginia, our newest submarine, is replacing the 688s as we speak. Uh, designed for Cold War, uh, designed for shallow water operations, lots of capabilities, um, very quiet, and she is going to have the capability for to carry up to uh, 40 Tomahawk missiles. These uh, Virginia payload modules can also be used or modified to uh, to UUVs or USVs as well. Those are not in play yet. Um, now we get some of the sensor technologies. Virginia actually doesn't have a periscope anymore. She has a photonics mast, which is, if you think a television camera on the end of a stick, you got the, the very basis of it. The, uh, but what it does is it allows the control room to be moved so it's not it doesn't have to be right underneath the sail. can be really realistically any place. But, but that allows it to move the lower to middle level and make it larger and also loses a couple of very big hull penetrations, which are worrisome. And you can uh, you can and do have a lot of different sensors on the photonics mast, including uh, infrared, uh, various electronic sensors. Uh, and it also allows for everybody in the control room to see what's going on on a large screen television. So whether we're on the spade fish for the Houston, for instance, when I was looking through the scope, nobody else saw what I was seeing. Now everybody can see on a large screen television. Toad arrays, uh, she carries two different kinds of toad arrays, a thin line, TB29, uh, which is designed for very, very low frequencies, a very long, very thin array. Think a garden hose uh, on a 2000 foot long cable or a fat line toad array, TB16, TB34, which is sort of a, I won't call it mid frequency, but a little higher frequency than the uh, thin line for reception. Uh, they're about three and a half inches in diameter, about 200 feet long. The uh, Virginia is also capable of launching UUVs, uh, various and sundry. There's a lot of them in development, a lot of them being used to do a lot of different missions. And she also can launch and does launch uh, UAVs, which are used for sensor packages. Uh, think of going launching a UAV, sending it out over the horizon is to see what's there or for comms relays. <clears throat> And now we get to Columbia. Um, Columbia is a big boat. Uh, I'm not going to spend any time with the missiles because they're the same missiles that the Trident uses. But look at some of these technologies. Here's that extern we were talking about being used uh, for depth control. Here is that. Well, this is actually what's called a propulsor. Uh, think of it as a uh, water pump. But this is that shrouded screw we saw on the Hunley. Uh, she's also electric drive, so there is no main turbine, if you will. There's a turbine generators, big turbine generators, and then an electric motor, which makes this screw go around, which saves a lot of, think of it as being a whole lot quieter. Um, now we get to diesels. Now, we don't have diesels. There are no diesels in the U.S., the uh, 
The reason we don't have diesels, we'll cover in just a second. But some interesting diesel technologies. AIP, air independent, air independent propulsion. There are three different kinds that are in use. A closed uh, cycle steam plant, which uses uh, typically alcohol and liquid oxygen to just make steam and make a turbine go around. A Stirling engine, uh, diesel fuel and liquid oxygen. Uh, not exactly a diesel engine, but if you think of uh, it uses a, uh, a separate liquid that expands and contracts to make the piston go up and down. And the diesel fuel and liquid oxygen heats that liquid and then a fuel cell. Uh, different technologies. But the thing with AIP is it allows the, the submarine to stay submerged for a long time. But what it doesn't do is allow the submarine to go fast. Uh, typically, a boat has to stay less than eight knots if they're using the AIP. If they want to go faster, then they're going to have to snorkel. And here's quickly, you can look over what we have here as far as the advantages of each of the different uh, kinds of boats. Why do we only, why do we not have diesels? I think this picture probably is the one to explain that. This is actually something that a friend of mine did back in the 1990s with uh, Desert Storm. He got orders to run Louisville, and that's a 688, uh, from San Diego with a load of Tomahawk missiles to the Persian Gulf to launch them. That's 11,500 nautical miles. He could do better than 30 knots, took him 17 days. If we were talking a diesel boat going all out, it was, three, it was 60 days, two months to get there. That's the primary reason that we don't use diesel boats. It's just a long way to get from here to there. Although many of our uh, allies, Japan, Korea, do use a lot of diesel boats for good reason. They're already there. Okay, and submarine is dangerous. I'm not going to spend, I would like to spend a lot of time here, but I guess I got carried out. Might need you to give us a, another hour of your time, George, uh, maybe during the summer. Uh, um, talk to I, I hated to cut you short, but we're coming up on the top of the hour sure. and we promised people 60 minutes and like to keep to that on time start on time wrap up so i've got a shopping list of questions which i won't get to ask you this evening um a couple other questions came in through the chat and maybe we can hit on a couple of those after we wish everybody uh, a good evening um very quickly we have a tentative program um, and a tentative date for our april uh virtual history lecture and that will either be Thursday the 18th or Thursday the 25th. It will be a Marine Corps uh, topic. And watch your all NOAS broadcast e uh, emails for more information. And uh, probably after the 1st of April, the full announcement will be up on the website in upcoming events. Uh, with that, uh, I want to wish everybody a good evening. Thank you for participating and look forward to seeing you again in April.